Morning. All right, welcome to another edition of our virtual church school. Um, maybe we be able to do this in person. I don't know. I think Pastor wants to, to continue this going on this platform, but maybe soon we'll be able to worship together in person. And Good, see morning. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Sister uh, Johnson, I think you're freezing up. Maybe something going on. All right. Good morning. Good morning. yourselves. That would be great. It's a lot of noise in the background. All right. Thank you. All right. That's a little better. All right. Let's uh, go ahead and get started with a quick word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this day. Thank you for the opportunity to come together as believers in Christ. We thank you for this time to discuss and study your word. We pray, Holy Spirit, that you will empower us uh, to teach your word, we pray that your Holy Spirit will write uh, practical things on our hearts that we can do to be more like you, to be conformed to the image of your son, Jesus Christ, and go out into the world and let people know that Jesus still saves. We love you, bless you. In Jesus' name we pray and we say amen. Amen. Acting weird today. All right, there we go. Mm. All right, have a good session. All right, we are ready to go. We get back to the beginning. All right, here we go, you all. So we're still on this uh, this this thought about faith uh, for belief for salvation. That salvation comes through faith and not works. And so the le today's lesson, August second, twenty twenty one, salvation for all who believe, is our, our title. Our lesson scriptures are Romans ten five through seventeen. And our key verse, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So let me go ahead. I know on my electronic version, they left off a verse. So let me get my phone out here so I can read from that. And we're going to go ahead and get started. All right. All right, here we go. Uh, Romans chapter 10, verses 5 through 17, New Revised Standard Version. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say it in your heart, who will ascend to heaven, into heaven, that is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend into the abyss? That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, 
you will be saved. For one believes with the heart, and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth, and is so saved. So and so it's saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is the Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But now, but how are they to call on the one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in the one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim it? And how, and how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not, not all have obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. I'll, our scripture lesson for this morning. All right, let me try to mess up together. All right, our introduction. In the text for this lesson, Apostle Paul continued his justification of the doctrine of salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. At this stage, it is reasonable to ask why Paul went to such great lengths on this issue. Why could I not let it go? The answer is in the first two verses of, chap of the chapter. He felt the same way you feel when you see someone you love determined to walk the streets of self-destruction. You cannot sit idly by and watch as relatives or friends destroy themselves or their opportunities for a better life. Paul knew his task to convince the Jews on what appeared to be a new doctrine was incredibly challenging. His reference to Israel as a nation showed he knew that the nation's traditional beliefs on salvation were firmly and widely, widely held. The task to encourage them to change their approach to salvation was, was, was tough. For the same reason, some arguments we have with people we love are often harsh. The Jews were not opposing Paul's position on salvation for the sake of resisting. With total sincerity, they believed that, that, that their traditional view of salvation as outlined in the Mosaic law was right. It was therefore a battle of strong, heartfelt, dissenting opinions. Also, please note that Paul pressed the matter because of his profound love for the people of Israel. He was not trying to win an argument. It was his heart's desire to get, the, to get the nation on the right track for salvation. Consider the notes in the text. Consider the notes in the next section to see how well Paul advanced our, advanced or supported his position that the proper way to salvation was to accept faith to accept by faith Jesus's atoning sacrifice. All right. Okay, uh, so our introduction is basically uh, once again setting the foundation that faith uh, is the track is the path to salvation or salvation comes through faith and grace, faith in Jesus Christ. And it, and it talks about how Paul had the challenge of breaking the Jewish people out of their doctrine um, of what, what it meant to be saved or the, out of their doctrine or what it meant to be in relationship with God. And so here's Paul uh, preaching this strange doctrine to them, telling them that you can't get there by faith, by works, that it's faith and the grace of God that gets you connected to the kingdom of God or gets you into heaven. And so Paul makes this argument with these Jewish believers who have been taught a, a whole different principle in regards to salvation. And I thought about this as kind of like what we're going through now with, with mass mandates and the different, uh, you know, because in America, we, we never had to wear a mask before. Uh, over in some of the Asian countries, they've been wearing masks for decades, you know, as an everyday thing. So now we're trying to break this doc 
bringing this new doctrine of mask wearing and, and protecting yourself and others from this virus that's going around that's airborne and passable. And it's hard, it's hard to break through on some folk because of political ideology. It's hard to break through on some other folks because of religious ideology. Some it's hard to break through on some other folks just because they they think they know better than than scientists and, and medical professionals. And, and so and so here we are with this battle of, of, of this doctrine of fact, of, to call it a doctrine of face mask wearing. And so it's kind of like this, that's similar to what Paul was facing when he's trying to show the, the Jewish uh, believers a new way or, or, or a better way uh, as it pertains to salvation. And so as we get further in the lesson uh, to unfold a little more about uh, salvation by grace, and salvation by works or by the law. And, and, and we are, excuse me, we are, we are kind of uh, linked to or lean towards this whole uh, relationship group through, to God through works. I mean, we, we've all kind of probably have been there if some of us are still not there. We, we, uh, we uh, attach what we do to our relationship, where really God says your relationship is not so much in what you do, but what you believe. So doing is just a part of what you believe, and, or doing should be a part of what you believe. And so, so, so we, we, uh, we work because we, we are thankful for what God did for us through grace, through salvation. And so, but some of us think that our works is the only thing we need to do. That if we show up for church, we work in the church, we do these other things, that that denotes a relationship with God. And, and we will put those, as I mentioned last week, we will put those standards on God and the word of God and we will make our own doctrine of what it means to have a relationship or what it, what it looks like to have a relationship with God. All right. Uh, somebody got something they want to add? You know how we do it. You can jump in or mute yourself. Uh, if not, uh, will somebody be prepared to read telling the Bible story for me? Okay. Please? I'll read telling the Bible story. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. People who appreciate the art of debating understand the approach Paul took to advance his position. He was adamant that his views on salvation were correct. The apostle had not the slightest doubt about his beliefs on how people should repair their relationship with God. He saw that the Jews were equally firm in their traditional views. Paul had to be skillful in refuting their established beliefs if he were to have any chance of selling his doctrine to the Jewish society Paul had to keep the audience engaged so Paul could not risk being offensive Paul took a curved carving knife to chip away at the Jews' traditional approach on how people obtain right standing with God. He saw that the Jews problem was blindness. They just did not understand God's righteousness and the divine plan for justification of the sinner. So they substituted their human design salvation method for God's for God's this was the best, this was the heart of the matter, and it worried Paul. In verse, in verse five, we see a stroke of Paul's brilliance. He asked the audience to consider the intent of the law they were seeking to follow. In making their, this point, Paul was referring to passages like Leviticus 18.5, Paul's slant, Paul's slant was to show what Moses, the lawgiver, intended. His, his was not a new position. The only way they could hope to keep what Moses intended 
was to approach salvation by the method of faith. In other words, they could never obtain righteousness by words, the traditional view. In what Paul was saying was, if what Paul was saying was true, then what was the purpose of the law? It was to point people to the perfect lamb sacrificed for the entire world. It was through Jesus that everyone received total atonement for sin, which the law defined. From there, Paul explained his argument to show that his method applied not only to the Jews, but to the entire world. Again, he made extensive use of the Hebrew scriptures, which the Jews readily accepted as authoritative. Passages like Deuteronomy 30, 14, Isaiah 28, 16, Isaiah 52, 7, and Joel 2, 32 provided reliable support for Paul's agreement. What do you think? How solid? Okay, now let us look at how some of the same issues play out in other countries. All right, thank you, Sister Dolores. And so, so here, I didn't highlight this, but as, as we reread it, uh, it jumped out at me. So it says, so they substituted their human design for salvation methods for God's. They substituted their human design for salvation method for God's. And so basically what the author is saying here is that God has a, has a, has a method or, or pathway to salvation and that we come and we add our own human slant to it and we say, this is the way to get there. And so we kind of had this discussion a little bit last Sunday. And so um, we talked about, we were talking about forgiveness and how, you know, and how God forgives and we was talking about, well, when somebody continually does something over and over, you know, how does God forgive that? And we talked about how out of our human nature, that's for us, if somebody offends us in the same area multiple times and they don't correct it, that we're ready to be done with them. And so then when we talk about spiritual things, we apply our standard to spiritual things. And, and, God, does, and God says, no, I will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west to remember them no more. And so God says, I, for me, it doesn't really matter how many times you, you sin, I can forgive you and I can forget about it. And that because we're in relationship through faith. And for us, that doesn't make logical sense to us. That doesn't make humanistic sense. And so this is what Paul is trying to get the Jewish believers to understand that you're putting your own standards on how to be saved, you're putting your own standards on how to come in relationship with God. But when God says, all you have to do is believe and confess, believe and confess. After that, it's up to God to judge the quality of your life. And so, and so we, we, we want to judge the quality of people's lives when they tell us that they're Christians. We want to judge, judge the quality of their works when we tell them that they're Christian. And we want to question whether they really saved. You know, if they was really saved, they wouldn't do that. If they was really saved, they wouldn't say that. You know, how could you become saved the, the three seconds before God called you home and you die? If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, you shall be saved. And so after that point, it's up to God to do what he calls separating the wheat from the tear. It's up to God to write the names of those who, who are in his family in the Lamb's Book of Life, as Revelation tells us, and that Jesus was the only person who had the power to open the book, to read the names. And so, so our, our job as believers is to share this good news, this gospel, that someone may hear it and someone may confess with their mouths and believe in their hearts. And then it's up to the power of the Holy Spirit and the community of faith to help that person grow into what God has ordained and called them to be. 
And so that's, that's, that's our Paul's challenge. And really that's our challenge too, because, because we, we put our own uh, uh, barriers into relationship with God. We put our own barriers and what it means to be saved. And when people don't meet our barriers, we, we have a tendency to want to throw them away. We have a tendency to want to reject them from that which we already enjoy. All right, anybody got anything they want to add? All right. Uh, who wants to read Sankofa? I will. Thank you. In essence, the central issue in the text, indeed throughout Romans, is a clash of theologies or religious ideologies. Paul had one outlook about the way to righteousness, while the Jews held a traditional opposing view. Let's look at Israel's religious makeup today. We must conclude that Apostle Paul's arguments had little impact on the Jewish nation. Paul's Christian views are shared by only a small fraction of Jews. According to our references, less than 5% of Jews are Christians. The tradition of Judaism persists and are still the dominant religious outlook in Israel today. The situation, however, is vastly different when we look at the Christian religion around the world. According to the more credible reports on world religions, Christianity still holds the top spot among world religions with over 2 billion persons. Naturally, there are various subdivisions with the general Christian faith. We might conclude that Paul was true to his mission as the apostles to the Gentiles, non-Jews. We find his views on salvation in the mainstream of Christian thinking in most countries around the world. What can we conclude from this observation? Each person must remain faithful to the assignment. God has called that person too. By some measurements, people will call us failures. However, the assessment that matters most is God's assessment of how well we executed what he assigned to us. Amen. Thank you. So question, what, what are you all, what, what's your perspective about this whole notion of uh, salvation through faith not being attached to works? Do, do, do you all still think that, uh, that works are a sign of salvation or works is, is a part of being saved? But do you all think that it's strictly faith? and believing in God, or do you think it's a combination of both? What, what do you all think about this since we've been talking about it for about four weeks now? This is Celeria. Um, I'm on my phone today. I think that it's a combination, that when you have the faith, then you demonstrated through how you treat others, uh, how you go about your life. I don't know if works is so much the word uh, I'm using, but when you have faith, you, I think you demonstrate it. Okay. So, so, so would that, so, so would that be a byproduct of, of your salvation or would that be a requirement for your salvation? A byproduct. Okay. All right. Just want to be clear. All right. Who 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 else? Anybody else? If you got a different an opinion, that's fine. We we can talk about it. Hmm. So what about um? So what about those people who 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 may come to church? One time, two times, have not, not a frequent church goer at all. They come and it's a high worship experience and they're moved to join a church. They go in the back or wherever they take, take 
persons who walk up to the front to join and some minister or some, some lay person leads them to the pathway of salvation. They pray, they pray the prayer of salvation. Uh, they confess with their mouths. They believe in their hearts. But then they never do nothing else after that. Is that person saved? Yes. All right. Anybody else got any opinions about that? It's all right, y'all. If, <laughs> if you think differently, it's, it's fine. We can talk. It's free, open, open platform for discussion. So I let me throw this in here again. Let me throw this in there. So, so I would I would venture to say, I don't know about you all who are on this morning, but I venture to say, if you gave that scenario to 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 uh, church goers, people who are consistent church goers, I would, I, would, I would venture to make a hypothesis that over 50% of those people would say, no, they're not saved. How can you do that and then never come back to church and never serve or never do this? They're not saved. That was just an emotional experience. And so, and so that's what I mean when I say we put our standards of what salvation is on other folks. Because there's nowhere in that Romans 10 where it says, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Christ, that God raised Christ from the dead, then you are saved if you go to church on a regular basis, if you work. It says, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart. And, and, and so for us, it's hard for us to grasp that somebody would stop at that point. Because we on Zoom every Sunday morning for Sunday school. We on Zoom for every, every Sunday morning for worship experience. Now that we're in this virtual environment, we, we come to, to special programs. Uh, we come to Bible study. Uh, we do all these other things, vacation, Bible school, that's getting ready to start this week. We do all these other additional spiritual works and spiritual acts. And so for us, that's our salvation. But when the word just says that you have to believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. And so, so I, I would I would venture to say that if you put that, as I said, if you put that scenario to to a lot of Christians, that over fifty percent of them would say that that person is not saved, that they would question that person's salvation. Y'all agree? Disagree? I disagree. You disagree? Yes, I disagree because I'm not a judge, and I don't want to be judged by just anybody. Amen. I hear you. And, and, and really, see, that's the position of a mature believer. A, a believer, as I, as I said in previous lessons, we get, we get uh, inundated with doctrine of the church. So what, whatever faith we in, whether it's Methodist, Baptist, Southern Baptist, Kojic, uh, non-denominational, we, we all have men and women who, who write the, uh, the policies, not the policies, but the, the, the way that the church is going to be run. And we have these books that we go to that outlines, this is what we believe, this is what we do. And we begin, and sometimes men and women will take doctrine and apply it to the word of God, but misapply it. And that becomes the thing we run with for years, hundreds of years. And so we learn these things. And a lot of times they, I won't say oppose the word of God, but they, 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 they put more on the word than what the word says. And so we'll say, yeah, you, you could do that, but if you, if you ain't coming to worship, if you ain't coming to serve in God, you ain't saved. Or we'll just, we'll, we'll debate about the age old speaking of tongues and, and baptism and how you baptize. Like a lot of other denominations, struggle with the way the Methodist denomination, our denominations deal with baptism. They tell you the only way you can be baptized is you have to be submerged and you have to say in the, in the name of Jesus. 
If you ain't do it that way, you ain't been baptized properly. And so, and, and but Jesus doesn't say that in the word. He says, go and be baptized. He don't, he don't have no distinctions of how to do it or what you say when to do it. And so they'll take that scripture where, where Jesus was baptized and they apply that to their doctrine. And then they add something more to it because they think this is what should have been there. And so that's, that's the only point I'm trying to make. But, but I hope that in that scenario that all of us will realize, as, as uh, Carolyn said, that it's not our job to judge someone's salvation. That's wholly left up to God and the work of Jesus and the Holy Spirit. We just want to share the good news that someone might believe and confess. All right, feel like I'm beating a dead horse right there. <laughs> anybody, <laughs> the horse is not coming back alive. All right, anybody want to read case study for me? <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, I'll take it. <clears throat> we can say Christianity developed away from Judaism on doctrinal grounds but this is not the only basis on which different churches develop. The birth of the black church in America is a fascinating case. Let us look at this from a historical background. Per the historical record, slavery started in, Amer in the Americas in the 1600s. As far as was possible, the Africans brought their traditional religions with them. Fears of revolts and rebellion among slave masters and deliberate policies that separated slave families allow slaves only limited occasions to practice their faith. Further, those who controlled the slaves saw slave religion as primitive. So these practices were discouraged, often by severe punishment. Nevertheless, some slaves tried desperately to cling to aspects of their original religion. As Christianity grew throughout the US, the slaves heard about the character of their master's God. In many respects, the new God differed from their traditional gods. You notice that there, they said the new God singular differed from their traditional gods, plural. He said, uh, he said and did different things. They looked to the new God for solace from their harsh realities and the new territories. Over time, Christianity displaced the traditional religions which the slaves brought with them. Around the 1740s, a mass conversion of slaves to Christianity started. For their own selfish reasons, slave masters allowed the slaves to convert to Christianity. It was a tool to keep control of slaves. The masters could not see uh, that soon Christianity would become the springboard from which the abolition efforts would come. In secret, slaves began their versions of church. Their invisible institutions became vital activity centers for the slaves. And then slaves developed their version of Christianity. Congregants planned many social interactions, including escapes. The start of the black church, therefore, had a broader focus than theology and worship practices. The slaves used Christianity to suit their needs. Their version was a blend of Christian principles with some of the traditional religion uh, they knew. So over time, two versions of Christianity developed in America. The white version justified slavery and sought to keep the slaves docile and in subjection to their masters. The black version gave the slaves hope for freedom and social interactions. In the black church, the slaves learned that group efforts were more effective than individual freedom attempts. Such knowledge led to revolts like the 1831 rebellion led by people like Nat Turner. The black church grew in organization and effectiveness. It became the breeding ground for many rebellions. It was outside these invisible institutions that the push for abolition of slavery grew. Quite obviously, these developments uh, sacred, I mean, scared the white population. The black church did not come out of the debate like the one in Romans. It was not the child of doctrinal differences. 
And although various personalities stood out in development of the black church, there was no apostle Paul. Instead, black Christianity grew from a necessity to address the realities of the slaves and their descendants. As people, we must assess whether today's black church is still focused on serving its members practical and spiritual, spiritual needs and aspirations, or is the black church being used serendipitously to serve the dreams of other interests? Mm. Somebody got something to say, I heard a mm. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Eric Espal, share, share what you're thinking when you heard the uh said something, sp something spoke to you, something you want to share. No? No. All right. I tried. <laughs> yeah, it is interesting because because they, they talk about, you know, uh, how Christianity grew throughout the U.S. And so we, we, we got to realize that a lot of our ancestors, uh, when they were brought here, they, they practiced Islam, they practiced other forms of religion. And so here they are brought to this foreign place, being stripped of their culture, their language, their uh, familiar ties. And now they've been given this other religion. And so those who were who, who, who ended up understanding this religion and were able to disciple this religion, understood that the religion or the Christianity that they believe in, this God that they were seeking was different than the God of their, of their masters, at least the God that their masters were promoting for the, for the sake of control. And, and it's, it's, it's always interesting to me how our spirituality, how our Christian faith can be a point of liberation and, and moments of oppression. That, that even oppressed people could see their freedom through Christianity and their God. And, and, and that's, what, that's what salvation gives us. Salvation gives us a hope that, that, there, that there is better. That if we don't see it on this side of, of, of heaven, that, that we'll see it on the other side of heaven when we transition to be with the Lord. And, and so that's, that's where that hope, that faith, and that, that grace of God comes in, that, that I give my life to you because I believe you have more for me. Uh, and that last point about uh, when they said about you, you have to make sure that you basically do what God's calling you to do, um, th that, that, this, that this relationship didn't come out of a debate, didn't come out of this thing, but it came out of uh, having to have a, 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 a eye for a different type of God to, to understand that we that they needed a God that could give them comfort in the midst of, of, of these uh, harrowing experiences that they were facing. And it, and it, and it uh, swung us to social action, to other things outside of our doctrinal practices and theologies or that, that people would not consider spiritual. You know, uh, the AME Church is big in, in the uh, civil rights movement. You know, people wouldn't necessarily consider that a function of religion, a function of Christianity of the church. But but that's what that's what we learn from our faith and our spirituality. That there's a there's a freedom that we should have, and that this country has is, is not totally given it to us. And so we're gonna fight for that freedom because it's a God-given freedom. I don't know if any of you all heard uh Sister Latasha's Brown uh, comment a couple of weeks ago when they got arrested in the in the uh, Senate building, and she basically kind of par I'm paraphrasing, but she kind of said that that you cannot take my agency away because God gave me this power, and you might try to take my vote, which I ain't gonna let you take because I'm a child of God and God has empowered me, and and so and so that's what comes out of our faith, out of our spirituality as a, as a black collective in Germany. All right. Um, anybody want to read life application if they don't have anything to add and we can. Uh... I wanted to add something real fast. Go ahead. Um, what I've noticed um, in recent weeks in social media 
is um, like a clash between um, like Christianity in this, in, and um, black uh, culture that um, people have been pointing out saying, you know, we as black people, we shouldn't be doing any, you know, using sage or using incense mm -hmm. um, because it's like witchcraft. Um, also, you know, um, like libations, like they, uh -huh. like in the traditional, uh, like in the African American community, where we do libations to like our ancestors. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it be something for like Kwanzaa or whether it be just you know just a libation. Um, I've been seeing, I've, I've noticed in social media, it's been a lot of talk of that lately, like okay, you guys need to, you know, stop doing these things while other people are saying, well, look, this is our background. This are, these are things that were bought back from um, Africa and you need to learn your history. I've been seeing a lot of that. And also um, a lot of people saying to break from like our white Christianity and realize that we have, you know, our own, um, background um so i don't know what's going on but i i've noticed it recently a lot in in social media yeah um i don't know if you're all familiar but on uh youtube and a uh, a site called narrative uh narrative is, is spelled with a k at the beginning and with narrative k means for knowledge uh dr gray carr uh professor at howard university uh, African Studies and uh, Karen Hunter, uh, Series X and Radio Host. They do these uh, YouTubes on Saturday called In Class with Carr. And maybe about three, four weeks ago, they did uh, In Class with Carr talking about religion. And so if you're more interested in what Sister Alicia, uh, Annalisa said, you can look that up on YouTube, In Class with Carr, and find the episode. It's probably about two, two and a half hours, and they delve deep into all that libations and all that type of stuff. And, and really it's, you know, libations and those things that, that she named are another form of spirituality. I mean, that, as she said, they brought those things with them from the continent. And, and so, so at some point, I think we have to learn to embrace other forms of spirituality that don't go against the word. Now, if there's something going against the word, that's different. But spirituality is 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 uh, comes in multiple forms. And and then the point about the white the white the white Christian white Christianity, I could go on about that for another hour. We don't have that time. <laughs> but I I struggle with that. I think I think this is Daryl. This is Reverend Williams' opinion. So y'all have to. This is Reverend Williams' opinion. Uh, I think there is a set that I call white nationalist Christian Christianity. And what I mean by that is that that, that sect of Christianity or that sect that is labeled Christian, labeled Christian, is more focused on keeping white power and keeping uh, white superiority over the tenets of what true spirituality is, when Paul said that there's neither Greek nor Jew, there's male nor female, bond nor free, that we're all one in Christ Jesus. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those ministries and those people who run those ministries, they might let you in, your, in their church, they might let you to give your money and your service, but deep in the recesses of the heart, once again, this is what Reverend Williams is saying, I don't believe they see you as brother and sister. They don't see you as you're part of the kingdom, I'm part of the kingdom, and we're serving the same God because, because their, their white framework comes into view and serving mm -hmm. their white God. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I don't remember if y'all remember like last year when Megan Kelly uh, was on Fox News and she talked about how Jesus was white and how Santa Claus was white. And she was serious about that thing. And, and, and because that's the framework of white Christian nationalism. You know, you got the paintings of the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus who come out of Egypt. 
And the last I checked, Egypt was squarely planted at the top of Africa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, all right, I'm going to get off that. All right. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it's a lot going on. And so, so I would say, well, I don't want to say that. Spirituality comes in a lot of different forms. And we, we've been taught as black people to name stuff that doesn't fit our Christian framework or what we've been taught doctrinally to, net, to label it as demonic. Oh, that sage is demonic. That libation, that's demonic. That's the devil. Uh, I'm not certain. That might just, that's just another form of spirituality. And like I said, mm -hmm. if you want to know more about that, Dr. Carr uh, talked about that in class with Carr on YouTube. They got a whole YouTube channel, tons of videos there. You can check out about a whole bunch of different stuff. And they break out books, all types of stuff. It's, it's really informative. All right. Um, somebody volunteer to read life application? Unlike scripture's account of Israel, which saw their God as exclusive to them, we must see Christianity as a religion for all peoples everywhere. So we must ensure that we do not let our religious practices become activities of an exclusive club for a select few. The church doors must remain open and welcoming to all who would hear the gospel of Christ and come to God. Against this background, Consider if you see any barriers in your church which unreasonably hinders people from becoming part of the Christian faith. It is useful to remember that when we came to Christ, that when we came to Christ, we were less than perfect. And today we may yet be a few steps away from perfection. Let us not demand of people let us not demand of people more than Christ demanded of us. From the days of Apostle Paul, Christians have supported sharing the gospel message at home and abroad. Practical evangelism is a necessary aspect of Christianity. Please consider your level of support for the expansion and maintenance of the Christian faith around the world. Are you fully convinced you are making a reasonable contribution in this regard? There are many places where Christians have no Bibles or Christian literature. Are you aware of this? Can you do more to support the men and women in developing countries who labor against tremendous obstacles to spread the gospel? Some of the world's major religions still place major emphasis on law keeping as a means to righteousness. Our focus as Christians is to form and maintain active relationships with Christ. That is, that we must invite friends and relatives in the, to the Christian faith to do. Remember, people are prone to run away from groups where the emphasis is on their abilities to keep some established rules strictly. As Moses instructed the Jews, people who attempt to find righteousness by keeping traditions must keep all the laws faithfully. If they fail in any one, they fail in all. That is the impossible task. This, yeah, that is the impossible task for people who try to find salvation by works. Please bear in mind that as you pray and pray for and invite loved ones to join in Christianity, Christians understand the futility of trying to adhere to the law as a means of maintaining a right relationship with God. They rest in the joy of the relationship established through Christ. Amen. Amen. That, that's it right there, resting in that joy of that relationship we established through Christ. And that, and that we can't keep the law. We, we, can't, we can never be perfect enough or perfect at all to keep all the law and, and, and to, to get salvation by, the, by, by those works of the law. That's why God sent Jesus. Jesus was a fulfillment of the law. Je Jesus completed the law. He, he fulfilled the law that we may live through grace by faith. And, and so, and we struggle with that because, because people tell you, well, you throwing away the Old Testament. What about the Old Testament? Yes, it's all, it's, it's all good. 
and it's all uh, applicable, but we, you know, we got to understand that we're in a new disposition. We're in a new covenant. The old covenant was destroyed at, at, at uh, Calvary. The old covenant was destroyed when he got up three days later. And so we're in a new covenant of grace and faith through salvation, relationship. And, and, and it's hard for us to, to, to sometimes grasp that because we're so retributive in our, in our stances with others. You know, we, we want people to pay for things that they've done. And when we sin and we, and, we, and we talk about this God who allows people to sin and still be in relationship and still bless them, it, it messes with us because that's not the way we work. That's not the way we think. And so, and so we, have to, we have to realize that this gospel is for everybody. It ain't just for your, your friends that you like. It ain't just for the people you run. To. It's for everybody. It's for, it's for the drug addicted person on the street. It's for the person who's selling themselves sexually. It's for the person whose mouth is foul as all. It's for the person who's an adulterer. It's for the per it's the gospel is for everybody. And everybody can be redeemed through faith. Society might not redeem them, but God can redeem them. And so, and so we, we have to be open to that thing. And it's hard because we will put up our parameters and our barriers to entry. And God says, whosoever will, let them come. Mm -hmm. Reverend Williams, this yes, is Martha. Um, I need you to help me to understand why so why did God give Moses the law if um if it could not save? That I, I mean I don't I can't I, just, I can't give you the answer on that for the mind of God, but just going biblically, you know. So so and because because you talk at law and salvation, you talk in the Old Testament principle, mm -hmm. the New Testament covenant principle, and so further back in the in the lesson. They, they lifted up those scriptures. And so even in the Old Testament, in the day of law, there were scriptures and prophets who came who alluded to that, that there would be a savior, that there would be someone who come that will fulfill the law. And so, and so, and so this, this is my understanding of it from a little bit of theology training, theological training I had at a little time spent person. So my understanding of the whole law thing is that this was, this was God's way to, to see, to, to have the people understand who he was and that to see if the people were with him or against him. And so, so he understood that they weren't going to be able to keep the law, but the law was their, their, their guide path. The law was their, their thing that, that directed them to God and show God that they were for God. But then God says, you know what? These folks, they can't keep this law. Although I gave it to Moses. So I'm going to have to bring someone down that can substitute, substitute himself for them. It was all part of the divine plan of God. If you read, if you read through the Bible and you read this, you know, read the Bible in this application, that was God's plan. Why God did it that way, I can't tell you. You know, why I bought my daughter a cell phone before she really deserved it? I can't really tell you. That was just in the mind of the father. That's the way the father was led. And so someday we won't understand. Uh, one, of my, one of my favorite hymns is uh, Bye Bye. We'll understand it better. Bye Bye. Mm -hmm. When all the saints come up, you know, we'll understand it. Bye and Bye. And so, and so there's some things we, we won't get here, but when we get to the other side and the scripture says we will be like him, we will understand that, but but a long, a short answer for a long explanation, I don't know why God did it that way. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? Maybe uh, Pastor Kearney, a doctor, or one of the doc the other two doctors on staff might have a little more for y'all than I do. Anybody else? All right. Oh, man, it's almost 9.30. All right. Um, see if we can dive these questions quickly. Uh, what is the best news that you received recently? 
And how did you receive it? And who shared it? And how and how did you respond? It's like a five part question. Um, Robert Williams. Yes. Um, the best news I heard this week was, uh, as you know, um, Sister Mamie McGee had surgery on mm -hmm. Tuesday. And um, I called her, I think the night before she had a surgery and we talked briefly and I said, I'm praying for you, Miss McGee. And she said, um, uh, I just said my prayers and get ready to go to bed. And she made it through the surgery successfully. And when I got the news, I was just overjoyed, you know, cause I knew her faith and God and everything. The doctors that brought her through, she's doing well. Amen. I shared with you all mine about my, my friend and coworker who, who survived COVID is now at home, uh, going through the rehab process. I talked to him on the phone a couple of times. And so that's, that's, just, that's just the goodness of God. That shows the power of God and, and why God keeps some here and God transitions others. That's another thing I don't know, but I'm just glad that God decided to keep that brother here for a little longer. And that, you know, so that's, that's one of the best things I've heard in a long, recently, news, best news I received recently. Uh, Reverend Williams? Yes. Uh, this is uh, Leola Johnson. Um, week before last, I had some very uplifting uh, news from my grandson, Dominique. I think uh, most of you know him. He's now working in uh, Florida. But um, he had COVID. He had the, um, that, that was the thing that really got to me because at, at the time that it happened, I just was not even thinking that he had not taken the vaccine. I, I was one of those people just took it for granted that he had. And of course, he told me he had not because of his belief he's a part of the group of young people, some that are saying uh, they have many, many questions in, uh, about whether or not they should take it. Um, but to go on, um, he did go through it. Um, it was less than 10 days, more like eight days. And um, it was not as intense as we've heard about with others. And I was so overwhelmed. I talked with him daily in uh, different things he could do um, while enduring it. And I'm happy to say he did um, survive it. It was very slight in terms of comparison with others that you hear about. And he's now back at work. So that was the good news for me. Amen. 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 That is real good news because my buddy, he was in the hospital for almost four months. Yes. Yeah, on the ventilator for like two of those months. So, yeah. So, God, yeah. Yeah. All right. So, um, do you extend yourself beyond your personal comfort zone to share the gospel with others? If so, how, when, and to whom? If not, why? All right, we're going to move on. <laughs> That's a challenging question. I mean, it's a challenge for the preacher because I, I, I have, but I don't frequently. So, yes, that for, you know, yeah, that's a challenging question to make us think, especially over these lessons we've been we've been doing the last several weeks. The last one: How might we, as individuals and as a congregation, renew our efforts to share the gospel with others? No thoughts. No condolences. No. <laughs> All right, so I said, um, 
uh, maybe by establishing a witness and training, uh, encouraging ourselves, others, and the body to remember it's our responsibility to share the gospel. So uh, maybe, you know, like I said, doing some type of witness training and then encouraging us to, to, to uh, share the gospel with others and maybe have some structured way to go out and do that. Anybody else got anything they want to add to that before we get ready to close out? All right. So um, the, the hymn or the, the song of devotion was, the church has one foundation. I'm not familiar with this hymn, uh, but I did find a YouTube. And we're going to share this quick two minutes and we're going to get out of here. The church has one foundation. It's Jesus Christ alone. She is his new creation by water and the word. From them he came and sought her to be his holy. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. With his own blood he bought her, and for her life he died. In toil and tribulation and tumult of the she waits the consummation of peace forevermore. Till with the vision glorious, alloying eyes of bliss, and the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. And the great church victorious shall be the church at rest. Amen. So that was um, that was not the entire hymn. That's like two two verses. If I remember, I think it was five, it's five verses or five stanzas in that particular hymn. All right, so we're going to do our recap with the young folks, and we're going to get ready to get out of here. All right, good morning, everyone. The young people decided that they'd like to know about places in the Bible. So I researched mountains, and there were eight significant mountains that were mentioned in the Bible, but mountains are mentioned 500 times in the Bible. And it was belief in ancient cultures that mountains were where God met on the earth. So they believed by worshiping in high places that they were in the presence of God. And Marlene is going to just give us two mountains that we talked about today. Marlena. Um, so one of the mountains we talked about was Mount Sinai. And it was, um, according uh, in the Bible, it says Moses received the Ten Commandments on, on Mount Sinai. And then another mountain that we talked about was Mount Moriah. And it was where uh, God tested Abraham to see if he would sacrifice Isaac. We're, thank you, Marlena. We're very familiar with the Bible stories, but not actually where they took place. So I found it very interesting to match the mountains with the significant uh, stories that the children have heard or accounts the children have heard in the Bible. Thank you, Reverend Williams. Thank you. Glad you all had a, a, a wonderful class. So let's uh, get ready to close out uh, with a word of prayer. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as part of your church on earth, we want to practice faithfully the doctrine set by Christ. Help us to know your truth and give us strength and wisdom to live by it. This is our heart's desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.
Thank you all once again. Hope to see you next week and see you yes. in the future. Yes, thank you, Reverend Williams. God bless you. Have a good day. Y'all too.